as science has developed, there has been some friction between religion and science. And this friction has characterized the debate about the plurality of worlds, whether there are other Earth-like planets in the universe, and whether we are alone in the universe. Hmm. So the early Greeks and Romans left us with a quandary, a debate, a controversy between two models, between the plurality of worlds in which, oh, those intelligent aliens probably lived on those other worlds, and the Aristotelian idea that the Earth is unique. It's a geocentric model. And this is the model that was largely passed on down to the early Christians in Europe. And uh, so for the early Christian church, the plurality of worlds was a heresy. No, no. But there were a few people who said some interesting things about this model. For example, here's Origen. He was lived in Alexandria, a very early Christian. And uh, he did not believe in a spatial plurality of worlds, but he did believe in a temporal plurality of worlds. So he thought the, there were not other worlds and other suns and other planets around these other suns, but rather earlier times the earth had a different world. He wrote, for example, there were ages before our own and there will be others after it. It is not to be supposed that several worlds existed at once. That's what is meant by a temporal plurality of worlds. Now, a few hundred years later, there was Augustine of Hippo, that's in North Africa. He was very influential. He wrote a book called The City of God Against the Pagans in the early fifth century. And uh, he argues that Epicurus's dream of innumerable worlds leads to an absurdity in the same way that Aristotle argued. And uh, Augustine didn't like Origen's temporal plurality of worlds. And Augustine is not somebody you want to get on the wrong side of because here's a picture of him disputing with the heretics. And he's not looking so happy with the heretics. Now, I don't know, a few hundred years later, well, 1320s, 30s, 50s, there's Nicole Oresme of France. And here he is writing, and he thought about the universe. As a matter of fact, he wrote a book called Livre du ciel et du monde, The Book of the Heavens and the World. And in this book, he wrote... I conclude that God can and could in his omnipotence make another world besides this one or several like or unlike it. Nor will Aristotle or anyone else be able to prove completely the contrary. So he was thinking, he was saying, hey, maybe there is a plurality of world in Aristotle. Hey, who's he? <laughs> then there's a German, Nicholas of Cusa, and he wrote a book, an interesting book of, called of learned ignorance in 1440. You can see the beautiful manuscripts that were being written at that time. And in this book, you can read, in the area of the sun, there exist solar beings, bright and enlightened intellectual denizens, and by nature more spiritual than such as may inhabit the moon, who are possibly lunatics, as whilst those on earth are more gross and material. Then along came Nicholas Copernicus. Now, he's in here not because he was an early church guy, but because he, is, he changed, he, he started the Copernican Revolution and because he had a heliocentric model, a model in which the sun is the center. Now, he shouldn't be given total credit for this because <coughs> Aristarchus of Samos came up with this same idea about 800, 800 years earlier, and Nicholas acknowledges Aristarchus for doing this. And Nicholas wrote a book called On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres. And here's a picture of the heavenly spheres. And what's the most important is the sun, soul, is in the middle. Then comes Mercury, then Venus, then Earth, then Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and then the sphere of the fixed stars. And this is known as the heliocentric model. And that essentially changes what people think of, what is, are we alone in the universe? What is the universe? Notice that he didn't publish this until the day, the, actually the year he died, and because it was such a heretical idea, I suppose. Now, the most vocal and prolific of the early Copernicans, the guys who are defending this Copernican heliocentric model, was a guy named Giordano Bruno. And here's when he's, he lived. 
And he said things like, there are countless suns and countless earths all rotating around their suns. Now that's a very reasonable in the sense that it conforms to what we think we know about other planets and other stars now. But he also wrote, the countless worlds in the universe are no worse and no less inhabited than our Earth. In other words, he was positing the existence of extraterrestrials on all these other Earths. And you can see that we know exactly when he died on the 17th of February, 1600, because this is how he died. He was burned at stake for these views. And you can notice that he's naked here, being burned. And here's another image of him being burned, but this time he has clothes on. And if you go to Rome, this is a statue you will see of, uh, of Giordano Bruno. And if you go to Berlin, you will see this statue. Here he is, he's naked and upside down because some sources say he was burned naked and upside down. Now, changing gears a little bit, there's Bernard Le Bouvier de Fontenelle. He lived a hundred years. And he wrote a book called Entretien sur la pluralité des mondes in 1701. And translated into English, that is, a week's conversation on the plurality of worlds. And in this book, he wrote, when you are told that the moon is peopled, you immediately figure to yourself, men like ourselves. And then a variety of theological difficulties occur. The posterity of Adam cannot have colonized the moon. How would they have gotten there? But it, and so here's a front piece of that book in, uh, in the center is the sun labeled one, two is Mercury, three is Venus, and then four is the Earth, five is uh, Mars, six is uh, Jupiter, and then seven is Saturn. And in 1701, those are the only planets that were known. But you can see around the edge, you'll see other stars with other planets, and that's the plurality, that's the plurality of worlds that uh, was talked about. So here's another image. Uh, the sun is the big circle in the middle, but you can see there are other stars with happy faces on them with planets going around them. So other solar systems, other planetary systems. Now this book, his book was a really a flirtatious pedagogy. So for example, he was sitting with a countess and pointing up at the sky and they were essentially flirting and it was very educational. And she said, I'll believe anything you choose about the stars provided it contributes to my happiness. And then he would said, I believe the moon is inhabited. I can be very civil to anyone that disbelieves it. And I always retain the power of going over to their side without disgracing myself. And then she said, if the people of the moon were so expert, they would have been here before this time. But he answers, the Europeans did not find their way to America till 6,000 years had elapsed. They were all that time learning the art of navigation. And the 6,000 years is the, the so-called age of the universe that was known at that time. And he says, and yet we are to suppose that these great planets were formed to remain uninhabited. Let who will believe it, I cannot. Now later on came Christian Huygens. He wrote a book called Cosmotherios, or New Conjectures Concerning the Planetary Worlds, Their Inhabitants, and Productions in 1698. Notice the word inhabitants here. So what does he write? That there is some such species of rational creatures in the other planets, which is the head and sovereign of the rest, is very reasonable to believe. For otherwise, were many species endued with the same wisdom and cunning, we should have them always doing mischief, always quarreling and fighting with one another. So <laughs> there has to be one, I guess, a sovereign. I guess this is a, an upper class way of understanding why there should be inhabitants elsewhere. Now, then comes William Herschel. Now, William, he was the discoverer of Uranus and he believed in an infinity of inhabited planets. And that's Uranus on the far right, taken from Voyager. Now he wrote, the sun is most probably also inhabited like the rest of the planets by beings whose organs are adapted to the peculiar circumstances of that vast globe. And he also wrote, we need not hesitate to admit that the sun is richly stored with inhabitants. This was in 1795 and there's the sun and that's where those inhabitants live according to Herschel. Now, he also, in 1789, I think that's the year the Bastille was stormed, while the French were storming the Bastille, William Herschel was building the great 40-foot telescope, I think the largest telescope that had ever been built at that time. And interestingly, 
He built this telescope not because of a desire to discover more nebula, 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 those are galaxies, but rather his quest to detect evidence of extraterrestrial life. He built a telescope because he was interested in extraterrestrial life. Now, later, 1835, <clears throat> there was a great moon hoax <clears throat> based on William Herschel's son, John Herschel, who was also a renowned astronomer in England. And uh, uh, some journalist in, uh, in New York wrote about all the great discoveries that John Herschel was making, and presumably there were Lunarians, the, the inhabitants of the moon. And this is a scene from 1835, picture of what supposedly he was seeing, but it was a giant hoax. Now here's a picture from 1844, and this is a bridge between worlds, and it's also the image on the front of this book, The Extraterrestrial Life Debate, Antiquity to, to 1915, written by Michael Crow, is uh, in, in 2008. Now notice that that's Antiquity to 1915. There's another book, Life on Other Worlds, from the 20th Century Extraterrestrial Life Debate by Stephen J. Dick, published in 1998, and here's a picture of Stephen. So if you're interested in the issues of the changing views of this extraterrestrial life debate, have a look at these two source books on the history of this, particularly in the West. These two books are excellent sources about our ideas of are we alone and the plurality of worlds. But in them you will not find the voices of non-Westerners or women. I wonder how different those voices would be. Maybe you can write such a book.